Euro Gold is driven by being the best civil engineering contractor in the Northwest, ensuring its clients are given the highest level of service that they deserve. Euro Gold work in a wide range of industry sectors, including house building, highways, commercial and industrial build. Lollavita, Lollavita is an award-winning, independently run Italian restaurant. Located on Rose Lane in the heart of Liverpool, real Italian style dishes using the best skillfully prepared, skillfully prepared by our chefs. Come and try our serious Italian experience. Supreme upholstery. Supreme Upholstery Limited is a manufacturer of quality bespoke upholstered furniture. Come along with your ideas for that perfect sofa to fit your home and let Supreme bring your ideas to fruition. We also offer a service to the contract market, including large hotel groups and small family run business. No matter how large or how small your order, you will always get that personal service from our sales team. Come along and visit our showroom. Hello everyone and welcome to the show. This week we'll be meeting John Fitzgerald from the Birmingham Iris Centre and we'll be chatting to him about his life and times and his involvement with the centre. But first up, we're off to Northampton to celebrate Bloomsday and the life and times of James Joyce. We'll also be visiting his daughter's grave, Lucia Anna Joyce. Jerry Malumbe and friends put on a wonderful celebration of history, storytelling and a good song or two. Alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, crying cockles and muscles, alive, alive, oh. Peter, of course this celebration has been going on quite a long time. Yes, well I'm a, I'm a local lad so I know these areas and in, in uh, 2004 I was informed that Lucia was buried here and we agreed to organise a Bloomsday by her graveside yep. and we've been doing it ever since 2004 and this is the 18th year we've been doing it and we're getting an increasing interest because of the book, because of the family and because of the connection of this area. There's a lot of Irish buried all around here. Donald Macaulay is buried over there, the woman who shot Mussolini is buried over there nurses, Irish nurses, who looked after Lucia in St Andrew's Hospital are buried all around this area. Many of them are still alive and they tell us stories about Lucia and how she asked about Ireland. And Jerry, of course Lucia would be delighted to know that so many people are here tonight in her honour and her dad's honour, but of course taking lovely photographs of her headstone as well in her remembrance. Yeah, it's um, like uh, Peter said, it's evolved over the years from Peter starting off the first Bloomsday in recognition of Lucha being buried here. And uh, he approached me and said, could I bring some people from Triskelion to do some reenactments? So over the years, we've all come along and local people have come. And as you saw and heard tonight, people contribute by reading from Ulysses and singing songs and talking about Dublin. And we never know what's going to happen. We have a set performance, but people who as you saw tonight who, who chip in make it what it is and it's evolved greatly and Richard and James as you know have written the play which we premiered in 2018 and we're hoping to revive it um, next next year for the 100th anniversary of the publication of Ulysses which coincides with the 50th anniversary of uh, Lucia's death. And of course you had a wonderful sing-along there with Sean Cannon and everybody joined in tonight. Yeah absolutely um, yeah Sean and as you met Paddy Kelly, uh, Luke Kelly's brother, in great voice at the age of 82. Sean is uh, a regular here at, at our Bloomsday, and he, having sang with the Dubliners, and Luke Kelly did, of course, 
all those years and one of the best of Joyce's books is his book of short stories called Dubliners. So it's all connected and it's all Dubliners being from Dublin obviously, Ulysses being set in Dublin, it's all come together fantastically, yeah. And you've done a wonderful job yourself here tonight, of course, performing, singing and just keeping the whole operation going so smoothly. Yeah, it's, it's a joy to do and uh, may I say, Martin and Annette, having you here as well, adds a kind of freance to, to the whole thing. Everyone goes up a gear because they're going to be on the telly. Thanks, Martin. Lucy Anna Joyce, born Trieste, 1707, died Northampton, 1982. Lucia may have been the daughter of a famous father, but she had her own aspirations. Deirdre, of course you're very well known to us because for your storytelling at the Crawley Irish Festival and of course your involvement with the Irish Studies Festival in Nottingham. But tell me, who was James Joyce and why do we celebrate Bloomsday? He changed the course of Irish literature, he changed the course of English literature. He just redefined the novel. And of course you've had the celebration here. It's been here for the last 16 years, I believe. Yeah, yeah I've only been at three or four of them, but I tell you now a story. I got a lift down here a good few years ago, the first time I came down, and there was no train back, and I would have been left on a park bench like Nora, only for Peter Mulligan and his wife who put me up that night and were really hospitable. So I really sympathised with poor Nora, being left on park benches all over the place, while James went looking for a place to live, because that's basically what I was like that nice. I started learning the words. I mean, I learned them for 2018, but like that's a while ago now. So I started about a month ago reading through them and then I taped them and I listened to them and, you know, <laughs> in the middle of the night. Uh, what about your storytelling in general? Tell us a little bit about that. We do some storytelling for schools around St. Patrick's Day because I did notice over the years it seemed to be very much the adults sitting around and God forbid us getting drunk and the children were kind of left out of it. So I started doing storytelling for the children uh, like in the market square on the day down in the Irish Centre and then I've got in touch with schools and gone in and done crafts with them and storytelling. I mean that stopped because of Covid. And can I tell you before, I mean this mightn't stay on record, but you caught me in Crawley one year storytelling. My cousin back in Tullow County Carlow saw me, rang up my sister down in Croydon and said, I've just seen Deirdre on the television. So you are being watched back in County Carlow. Yes, weep, and however my foes may condemn, thy tears shall efface their decree. For heaven can witness, though guilty to them, I have been but too faithful to thee. James, we've had a lovely celebration here tonight at Bloomsday. How long have you been coming? I suppose about 10 years I, I got to know about it. Over the years I met um, Richard Rose who was also attending it. Maybe four years ago Richard uh, said, would I like to collaborate on a, on a play about with Lucia Joyce as the focus? And Richard had written a number of monologues uh, imaginary monologues that people who knew Lucia would perhaps have addressed to her and asked me whether I'd like to work on it and work it up into a play. Um, so uh, we took it from there and um, I did some connect, wrote some connecting scenes and introduced a couple of other characters till we had um, about an hour long drama. So we thought a more, a more structured centrepiece would be a good idea. So three years ago, 2018, we did it. and. Uh, we're hoping to do it again next year, on the, which will be the 40th anniversary of Lucia's death. So we should be uh, we should be doing it again then. And it, it's pretty effective when you get the char characters costumed, and we have Samuel Beckett in it, and Nora Barnacle, Joyce's wife, and Frank Budgeon, and people like that. So it, it worked pretty well. Yeah. And so I'm going to read a passage now, which is from the biography of Lucia, written by. Carol Floyd's Loop Schloss from the United States. Um, it's the only substantial work on, on Lucia's life. And I'm, the passage I'm going to read is about Lucia entering a dance competition in Paris. Well, a bit like James, I've been coming for a, a number of years and traditionally everybody's read something, so I've read odd bits of poetry, uh, some from Joyce and some from other Irish writers occasionally. And then uh, I had an idea about what it must have been like for Lucia to be separated from so many people who meant so much to her, from her father, obviously, her mother, from Sam Beckett, who she's 
reportedly had a, a long and unfulfilled relationship with and from one of her her dancing friends, a lady called Kathleen Neal, who was often referred to as Kitten. So I, I imagined what it would have been like for her trying to make contact with the, these, these people. And it occurred to me often if you go to a cemetery like this, you will find people who are talking to people in the graves. You know, they're talking to their dead spouse or their relative, whoever it is. And I thought, well, why shouldn't that work both ways? Wouldn't it be nice if there was a communication between Lucia and these people who meant so much to her. So we had this kind of idea of this fiction of these people visiting Lucia, but having written letters to her saying things that they should perhaps have said to her while she was alive. So uh, I'm working with James, who's a very experienced playwright. It didn't take us too long to bring things together. And, and you know, 2018, the performance by Triskelion was uh, very successful and we've been delighted with the response to it. She died of a fever and no one could save her And that was the end of sweet Molly Malone Now her ghost wheels her barrow through the streets broad and narrow Crying cockles and mussels alive, alive, alive Sean, great to see you there giving us a few great songs. Oh, it's a pleasure. I, you know, it's a memory from two years ago. We, did, we were here before. Do you do much singing down around Coventry in this area at the moment? No, I wish I wish we had. But of course, Covid has killed all the music and catering and it's a sorry state. But normally, if we didn't have the virus, would you be out singing? Oh, I would. I would. I would. Yeah, I'm getting very hoarse because I'm not using that muscle anymore. And Paddy, of course, you've got a great voice. Of course, you're the brother of... The late Luke Kelly, yeah. Yes, unfortunately, poor Luke passed away in January the 31st, 1984, at the age of 43 years of age. But he left what you call Luke's legacy. And uh, we miss him dearly, all, even after all these years. And um, I do recall Sean... When he was ill and wasn't able to perform, Sean took his place in the Dubliners and we've become big friends ever since because I've moved to Coventry from, back from Dublin and we've met up again after a long time. And Sean, it's great to know that you keep the friendship, uh, you guys, you know, that you played together, done so much together in your early years. Well, the cement is the music. It keeps us all together. Well, listen, lovely to meet you both tonight. No, they never, no more. Will I play a while over? No, never. What a lovely occasion and there are so many dedicated people to make sure that the life and times and history of James Joyce lives on. Now we're going to take a little break and we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Eurogold is driven by being the best civil engineering contractor in the Northwest, ensuring its clients are given the highest level of service that they deserve. Eurogold work in a wide range of industry sectors, including house building, highways, commercial and industrial build. Lollavita. Lollavita is an award-winning, independently run Italian restaurant. Located on Rose Lane in the heart of Liverpool, real Italian style dishes using the best skillfully prepared, skillfully prepared by our chefs. Come and try our serious Italian experience. Suprema Upholstery. 
Supreme Upholstery Limited is a manufacturer of quality bespoke upholstered furniture. Come along with your ideas for that perfect sofa to fit your home and let Supreme bring your ideas to fruition. We also offer a service to the contract market, including large hotel groups and small family run business. <music> No matter how large or how small your order, you will always get that personal service from our sales team. Come along and visit our showroom. Welcome back. Now we're off to meet John Fitzgerald from the Birmingham Iris Centre and we'll be chatting to him about his life and times and about his involvement with the centre. The Birmingham Iris Centre in Digbeth closed its doors just over 12 months ago leaving behind some fantastic memories of great bands that played there. It was the hub of the Irish community in Birmingham for many years. Born and raised in Birmingham, but Irish to the bone. My mama came from Galway, my daddy from Jerome. Came here to find employment back in 1964. They met up in London town down in the Gathy Moor. I was born in a, a little in a house called Gobbinstown House uh, near New Ross, County Wexford. And uh, we had six children in the family. In my own family, we have seven children. We have nine grandchildren and one great grandchild. I came to Birmingham in 1958 and I came to a little place in Basel Heath Road in Basel Heath to a friend from back home called Dennis Owen and his wife Rose. And uh, you always had to know somebody that you came to when you came from Ireland to England. It meant so much to me to know somebody. So when I, when I got to know them, I had to start looking for a job. So I walked from their house into Digbert I passed this little restaurant called St. John's Restaurant in Digbert and I went in for a cup of tea. So I carried on walking into town, out to Aston Cross, out to where Spaghetti Junction now rests, up along the Tyburn Road and I got a job in the Fort Dunlop making bus tyres. You kind of had to look for a, a place and you wondered where would you get to know people and the early centre came to mind because it was mentioned to me, the Irish Centre was in Moat Row and it was run by Father Richard Murphy. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was only a small little place and uh, Moat Row doesn't exist anymore. But Father Murphy started a housing scheme up there in that place. Well, I met my wife Margaret in 1959. We got married in 1960. By, the, by 1963, we had three children. So Father Murphy started this housing scheme. And what you did was, you, uh, if, you got a, a, if you got a flat, and it was on 171 Hampstead Road in Hansworth, which was nearly in all an Irish community then, just up from Hansworth Park. And uh, Paddy Maxwell, who was one of the greats in the Irish community in Birmingham, plastered that place. And when the first house was ready, we were the first family to move in there. The Irish Centre in Moat Row lasted for 15 years. We started the, the Father Murphy's Club there, and we started the Wexford Association. So you got all these lads together from your own county, and you started the County Association. It moved to Shadwell Street at the back of St Chad's Cathedral. Yeah. And they had the same t system there as they had in Moat Row. But right. more show was closed because it was being redeveloped. Yeah. And some lads came together, they were quite good lads, you know, and they, they, start, they started a 32 County Association. Yeah. So it, what the idea was to try and get all the different counties to form their own association. So they had a meeting at more show with an idea of what would they do. And they rented this place in Digbit the same St. John's restaurant that I used to go into for a cup of tea. Yeah. So they decided to rent that and they rented it at a fee of £3,000 a year. And then after five years, they bought, they bought the lease of the place 
for £55,000. So that was kind of the start of the Irish Centre. Yeah. Have now got the Irish Centre, which was the old St John's restaurant. Galway Travel set up their offices in there in 1971. And uh, that was the first Irish travel agency ever in England. And uh, in 1981, the first extension was added to the Irish Centre. It took, the, it took the, the Irish Centre from a small little building right the whole way around to the inside of the pavement. Yeah. So it was quite big. In 1964, the 32 County Association were registered as a limited company. I opened a shop with Brendan Shine in 1979 in Sparkbrook, 145 Stratford Road, Sparkbrook. I was managing Brendan Shine at that time and because I had my own band and I had my own band, the Castaway Show Band, uh, which I ran for 25 years and we were playing all the ballrooms and the clubs in England. In including the Carousel in Manchester and the Ardry in Manchester, which I think you might know. And uh, there, was, uh, there was 18 ballrooms in London then. And then you had early centres that we used to play from Red Car right down as far as Southampton. And we played all these Irish clubs. But because of that, I had all these contacts. And with the result that a friend of mine in Dublin asked me to take on management of bands and groups from Ireland. So I started to bring over bands like Just Four, Two's Company, The Kinslers, uh, Dave Minahan's band, uh, and Brendan Shine. His manager approached me to look after his affairs in England. So I met Brendan on the motorway one night, and I suggested to him we open a, a, a record shop in Sparkbrook. This place was up for sale. So we opened a record shop in Sparkbrook in 1981, two years later, because Brennan was, was so busy playing all the venues, I would do about, you know, 14 to 15, 16, 18 nights straight through for bands then, whereas you can only get, you couldn't get two nights now. Yeah. And uh, so Brendan, I let Brennan go his own way and I've moved my shop into the Irish Centre in Digbert. And that was the beginning of Minster Music in the Irish Centre. There was a lot of activities taking place, so it was much improved from what it had been. You had the Tuesday club, you had music classes, you had Irish dancing classes, you had all sorts, you had Gaelic classes where they were teaching the Irish language. So you had all these operations going on in the Irish Centre, which was great. And it gave something for people to go to. The second extension was added to the Irish Centre in 1990 at a cost of 350,000. When that was being done, I ran my shop from a porter cabin outside the front door, which only, there's a photograph of it there, it was only a little, a double porter cabin with the workers on the top one, and I had a shop underneath. But I ran the shop from there, and uh, when, when the centre was finished, of course, I moved back in to the other side at the centre opposite where, where I had been before they started to do the conversion. Yeah. And uh, it was, the whole thing was great because now you had four rooms in the Irish centre. You had the Linster, Munster, Ulster and Connacht Suites. From 1984 to 1993, I ran a Midlands Irish Festival, which went on for maybe Wednesday or Thursday, right through to Monday night. and. Brendan Shine closed all those festivals and the biggest crowd was ever in the centre was on a Monday night, Monday afternoon for Stockton's Wing. 1150 people. A lot of this was thanks to the second generation who gave it great support. And uh, so it, what tended to happen when you opened the doors, uh, the, the mums and dads came in. The pubs were open until 11 o'clock then. And, uh, when the pubs closed, the second generation, the kids all suddenly arrived outside the area centre. So you would have a queue going right around from the side of the centre, around to the front door. From 2002 to 2018, I ran the Minster Music Charity Night. In 2001, it received was appointed 
I was in my shop and I remember Dermot Hegarty was upstairs in the office doing some bookings and he came down to me and he said, the receiver's in. So the place went into liquidation, was liquidated, went into receivership in 2001. And of course, when that happened, Galway Travel were finished. The Irish Centre was gone. The committee had all to re re resign. And because I had resigned all my positions uh, three years earlier, my shop wasn't affected. So that was the only thing that was intact when I went into receivership. And uh, it was very sad. But then the Irish this formed a new committee and they got a loan from the Irish government, the Owens family, Westbourne Leisure, took over running the Irish Centre. They added so much to it, it was really built it up again. Suddenly one day they came in and told me that the centre was closing. I had three months notice, so I started a sale and I handed in my keys to Paul Owens on the 6th of January 2020. We celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Irish Centre and I did the 40th anniversary of Minster Music. But on the 50th anniversary of the Irish Centre, I had Mike Denver, Brendan Shine and Bob Raleigh. And on the 40th anniversary, I had the same line-up of Minster Music. So kind of, there were some great nights and it, sadly, it's all history. It was lovely meeting John and chatting to him about his life and times. John has got so much history about the Irish community and all things Irish in Birmingham. It was a pleasure to meet him and I can't wait to get back to meet him again and find out some more history. Well that's the end of the show for this week. Henry McGlade is back with us next Thursday evening with his show from County Mayo at 7pm and we're here with the Irish in the UK at 7.30. Until then, bye bye.